Okay. A good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, for everybody. A very warm welcome on this webinar organized by GD and NABC on the topic of poultry disease surveillance, control, and monitoring in East Africa. We are very happy that we found four speakers, good speakers for this webinar, and also, of course, that we have a big audience. We are very happy that we can do this on this, yeah, uh, in my opinion, important topic. Uh, importance of disease control, it's one of the topics or the targets of this meeting to, to create awareness for the importance of disease control and also to indicate uh, what can be improved, what can be done, what is technically possible on disease control and monitoring for poultry. And uh, I hope that after this webinar, well, at least a bit more will be clear about it. At the end of the webinar, there will also be a call for action. People are, who are interested and willing to participate in a working group, how to set up a uh, disease monitoring and control system uh, can be together with GD in a working group to see what is possible. Uh, and of course, uh, then there will certainly be a follow-up organized by NABC and GD. Yeah, for the importance of disease control, it's not always uh, nice to mention COVID, but in fact, COVID has proven uh, how important uh, disease monitoring is. Uh, to take the right decisions, you should know about the disease situation in a country, uh, like for example, in the Netherlands with COVID, our government, weekly got data about uh, disease spreading or numbers of uh, uh, people who get ill going down. So these figures are very important. Also constantly it was known how many people were in the hospital. And uh, with these data, you can take, of course, good decisions. For poultry, this is not different. If for poultry, you want to have uh, in a country on country level, a good control, uh, uh, monitoring system is uh, of big, big use, is very important. Um, and of course, uh, certainly where uh, poultry density is increasing, farms are getting bigger. Uh, in a country, more and more poultry is kept uh, on a larger scale, then it will be more and more important to have a good monitoring system. For all the audience, I would tell, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A &A, Q &A, uh, box. Uh, at the end, we will answer your questions. And please, when you have a question, uh, tell also or write in the box to whom you address this question so that we know uh, to whom we can ask this question. Rests me to... Uh, introduce the speakers very short uh, you will certainly see them of course uh, during their presentations but the first speaker will be the cvo of kenya dr obadaya nyagi uh, who will tell us about disease monitoring and uh, surveillance and control in east africa after that there will be janine wiegel from the royal gd in the netherlands the poultry health uh, station she is the poultry veterinarian there. She will talk about disease monitoring and surveillance uh, in the Dutch perspective. After that, uh, there will be Mr. Thomas Mullins, the director of high care of Skippers Group. And he will uh, tell how to control diseases on the farm level. And finally, there will be Mr. Bart Stockfish, technical service manager of Hendrix Genetics, and uh, he will talk about why a high health status is important for breeding companies like Hendrix Genetics. I wish you all a very nice webinar, and I will start now giving the word to the CVU of Kenya, Dr. Obad Obadaya Nyagi. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to join you from the city of Arusha in Tanzania. As you might not know, I'm not in my home country at this moment. I'm attending a, a meeting in Arusha, Tanzania, but I'm happy to be able to join you nevertheless, uh, to participate in this discussion on a very uh, interesting or important uh, subject of uh, disease surveillance and control and monitoring in the area of poultry, or in the poultry industry. 
I'm, I'm hoping that by the time I'm through my presentation, I'll be able to have given you a general overview of the setup of uh, disease control in my country, and more so focusing on the poultry subsector. Uh, that's where I sit when I'm back home. That is our headquarters of the veterinary services. If you can move to the next slide. Yes, I intend to give a, a, a very brief uh, history of our directorate and our legal mandate and the framework that supports our operations and the collaborations. And then I'll come to the specific uh, topics you proposed. I'll give some overview of uh, the situation in Kenya. And then I will finish up with some other government efforts that relate to the subject that we are discussing. Kindly move me to the next presentation slide. Great. So uh, for those you know, our, our directorate or uh, the function of veterinary services in Kenya is quite, quite old. It's actually dates uh, before independence, having been established in 1902. That makes it one of the oldest directorates in the government of Kenya. And it was initially introduced by the white settlers, the colonialists, for the purpose of uh, protecting their exotic breeds from the myriad of uh, livestock or animal diseases. In the same way, our veterinary faculty is perhaps the oldest at the Kenya's premier university, that's the University of Nairobi. Next slide, please. Right. So our mandate is clear and is well embedded in the law and all the instruments that govern our service. It's basically to safeguard animal and human health, to improve animal welfare, to increase animal resource productivity, and of course, to ensure safe and quality animals and animal products for food security and trade. Next slide, please. Our vision there as a veterinary service and mission, I think that is a, can be read clearly. And you move me to the next slide, we'll be looking at, uh, or I will be presenting the legal framework. Yes, we as a country became members of the OIE in 19, 64, that is soon after independence actually. And generally our legal framework is largely a domestication of the OIE guidelines and international, or our constitution does specify that international protocols ratified by Kenya happen to be part of our constitution. So whatever it is that we have domesticated from OIE, is basically part of Kenya's constitution. We have some key legal instruments, acts of parliament, at least in there, the Animal Diseases Act, the Meat Control Act, the Veterinary Surgeons and Professionals Act. This is the one that governs the practice of the profession in Kenya, including the paraprofessionals. The Rabies Act for the purpose of control of rabies, the Public Health Act, this is where we, we interact uh, with our colleagues in uh, human health. A bit of what we do and a bit of what they do have commonalities and they are captured in the Public Health Act. And then the Cultural Cleansing Act is basically for tick control, but we are in the process of reviewing uh, some of these acts, especially the Animal Diseases Act, the Meat Control Act, and, uh, <clears throat> and the Cultural Cleansing Act to bring them in line with the new realities and of course the setup of our current government being uh, governed in two levels, that the national level and the uh, devolved county levels. So we are trying to make sure that the, the old laws, the pieces of the registration are sensitive to the current setup of government. Of course, we are also uh, party to inter certain international treaties and conventions, including the OIE 
the Codex Admiritarius, the FAO and WHO statutes. And because of those, we collaborate quite a bit, or quite a lot with a number of REGs, that is the regional economic uh, communities, like the one I'm right now participating in, this is the EAC. We are also members of the IGAD, that is the intergovernmental, uh, the, the institution that actually looks at the intergovernmental issues around the Horn of Africa dealing with the development. We are also uh, participants in the AU um, setup, which is uh, through a, an institution called the AU IBA. If you move to the next slide, it shows more in details. These are some of the institutions I've mentioned, the OIE, the CDC is a partner here in matters perhaps of uh, public health, especially now in zoonosis and AMR, FAO, then the EAC, WTO, Codex, I mentioned the IGAD and ICPALT, the ECP. CARO is a national research institution that focuses on the uh, agriculture and livestock uh, research. Then the AUIBA, Inter-African Bureau for Animal Resources, and IRI, and in fact, like you might know, we host one of the IRI facilities in Africa that deals with large rights of research. Next slide, please. So coming down specifically to poultry health, a small background to perhaps bring you up to date on the situation in Kenya. We have an estimated poultry population of about 29 million bands. And poultry farming in Kenya is largely based on small scale rural and peri urban enterprises, basically for income generation and for supplementing food and nutritional security. Our mean annual poultry meat production is about 20,000 metric tons and an egg production of about 1,255,000,000 eggs per year. Of course, apart from chicken, we have other poultry species that are kept by Kenyans. These are ducks, turkeys, pigeons, ostriches, guinea fowls, and quails. Next slide, please. When you look at how the, the industry is structured, you can separate about four sectors. One being the, the sector that consists of the integrated industrial producers, that is the big companies, big commercial farmers. The other one is made up of the breeders or the hatcheries, which are quite a number in Kenya, producing both uh, commercial layers or breeding layers and uh, broilers for the purpose of producing uh, day old chicks for commercial farms and the other small farmers. The third sector is dominated by smallholder semi commercial farmers, while the last largely constitutes uh, the village or the backyard or traditional poultry production. The next slide, please, showing you uh, the lineup of the various actors in Kenya's poultry production value chain, including the poultry farmers, the hatcheries that I mentioned, the large commercial broiler and layer farms, the feed millers, the transporters, the traders, and of course the animal health service providers, whether they're in public, or private sector. We have two enterprises that keep or produce the grand parent stock and a number of others that produce parent stock for the farmers. And the, this one serves as the foundation for, for a big proportion of the commercial broiler production in the country. Other Enterprises, a number of them, 
produce Dell chips because there is quite a huge demand and some of the established ones are not able to reach to the very remote parts of the country. So you realize that there is a lot of interest in production of day on chips and we're beginning to see a lot of uh, investment in that part of the chain. The next slide, please. Of course, like any other country in this region, because of the production systems, we have a number of pottery diseases that are common, but they are mainly determined by the, the production system that is uh, involved. The intensive pottery production is, uh, is common for broilers and layers, driven by demand in meat in the urban areas and eggs. But of course it poses a challenge when it comes to use of antimicrobials, we'll come to that later. But the most common diseases on the next slide happen to be the Newcastle disease, Kuboro disease, coccidiosis, hemidiasis for typhoid and for cholera. But it's important for us to note that up to now, Kenya has not reported presence of avian influenza. We have been lucky in that area. In the next slide, I'm trying to outline the structure of our biosecurity measures, which happen to be uh, different in terms of the level of production, which determines the kind of investment that is made to us biosecurity or the risk levels. It may also be determined of the, by the understanding or the level of understanding of the, of the farmer or the keeper of the players involved. It could also be determined by the by laws in existence in that particular county. The use or lack of it of farm protocols and then, of course, the amount of resources that are set aside to develop the, or to facilitate or to equip the various enterprises for biosecurity missions. Of course, when you look across, you see that they are, the biosecurity measures are highest at the hatcheries and the big breeding farms commercial farms, and they may be lowest at the back end level where the production is actually largely free range behind the, the houses or so-called backyard. We have vaccination programs at the breeding hatcheries where it is a requirement by law that certain vaccinations are done at the breeding level, that is at the hatchery levels. And by the time the day old chicks leave the hatchery, certain vaccinations are required to have been done. And the farmer will also live with a protocol or a schedule that guides them on what other vaccinations and the timing of those vaccinations they need to carry out along the life of the bird. Breeding farms or hatcheries are by law quarantine facilities in Kenya, so they fall under the supervision of the CBO and are regularly or annually inspected or also inspected whenever there is need, perhaps a report of some potentially uh, infectious disease, but they are largely really under the supervision of the CBO. We do have contingency measures. The next slide, please. We have developed contingency measures or plans for certain important diseases that are not endemic in Kenya, but are a preparatory mechanism should they happen to appear in Kenya. And a good example is the bird flu. I mentioned earlier that there are statutory requirements for vaccination against certain diseases at the hatcheries. 
to make sure that the bonds that are released to farmers have some level of protection against the major notifiable diseases. We do annual inspection of the hatcheries and license them. And the inspection is usually there is a kind of operation that brings out the disease situation on the hatchery. If there is need, we are able to delay operations or postpone operations or influence in some way operations of the facilities depending on the outcome of the inspections or even deny license. We do risk analysis for trade certification as part of our government preventive measures, trading across borders. And we do have an official list of notifiable diseases as guided by OIE. In facilitating trade, we issue movement permits for movement of animals from one part of the country to another. And of course, require that when animals and animal products an international veterinary certificate, which is founded on a positive animal health certificate. We have across the country regional laboratories which support disease diagnosis and the surveillance. I think we are about eight in the region and a few more are coming into operation soon. So every part of our country perhaps as a, as a regional veterinary laboratory where they can get support to be able to do disease surveillance and uh, diagnosis. In Kenya lately, we have uh, positively uh, witnessed uh, the interest of the mainstream media to play a role in educating farmers on management and disease control. And uh, what the CVO does is to provide the oversight on the messages that the, the media presents. Dr. Rubodaya, please yes. keep in mind the time a little bit because we are yes. running out of time. I'm about to conclude, thank you. I think I have uh, the next slide is on just a mention of our one health involvement. We are working hard in hand with our colleagues in the human health. We have a platform and a, a physical office where we interact basically to drive our responses or surveillance on zoonotic diseases. So, and the last slide is just to mention that we have a, a national regulatory authority or agency for veterinary medicines and vaccines, which is uh, now purely under the, uh, the, the, the veterinary competence. In the past, this uh, responsibility has been done by uh, an institution under the human medicines and another one under uh, crop agriculture that is a uh, Pest Control Product Board and the PPB. But now uh, in 2015, we established one that is purely 100% under the competence of the veterinary service. With that, I think I end my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Obadaya, for giving us an insight in the situation in Kenya. And we immediately go on with Mrs. Janine Bichel who will give us an insight in the situation in the Netherlands. For you, the microphone. Yes, thank you. Um, I will also share my screen so you can see my presentation. Uh, my name is Janine Wiegel and I am a poultry veterinarian from the Netherlands, uh, working at Royal GD. And there's a slight delay in the presentation. I'm sorry for that. I would like to uh, discuss with you the importance of disease surveillance control and monitoring for your uh, poultry production. But first setting the picture a little bit, uh, poultry production is growing in the world. So globally consumption grew largely in the last uh, 30 years, but also is expected that in the next 10 years there's another 25% growth in poultry protein demand. So that is a huge growth to also be expected. Um, 
also in African countries. And every growth in an industry and in animal production industry will inevitably result in an increased risk of transmissible diseases, of ineffective use of drugs and vaccines, and of suboptimal products. And those products can be due to uh, residues or zoonotic pathogens or even antibiotic resistance. And the counterattack to those increased risks we view is organized disease control. So that's why we organized this seminar together with NODC. And we view that it's the principle of making arrangements on how to communicate and also on how to detect, act, prevent, and respond to the presence of disease. So organized disease control can have several goals. It can provide a status, uh, for instance, to your products or to your um, production uh, system. It can help you to correctly use end time interventions to reduce economical damage due to infections, for example. It can prevent the spreading of diseases, spreading geographically, so from one farm to the neighboring farm, but also within a, a production chain, within compartments. So from um, the parent stock to the production sites, for example. And also it can help you to ensure quality and safety of your products. So what do you need when you want to set up organized disease control? You need to know where the chickens are. So first there is a need for registration, farm and flocks, diagnostic capacity. Also what are, uh, my previous uh, speaker also said to you, diagnostic capacity, regionally and centrally is very important for disease diagnosis, but also for quality control of products. You need to set up a monitoring program, a sampling program, but also assign samplers, for example, um, assign tests, acc accredited and recognized tests for your monitoring program and a site on which interventions can be used. You need some kind of enforcement that can be legislation, but it can also be um, related to your product and communication on your program. So it involves all levels of production from a clear policy, which can be governmental or private with designation of roles, responsibilities and initiatives, and also a dialogue between the different partners. You need the availability of quality drugs and vaccines to ensure surveillance of field efficacy and also the prevalence of pathogens, sufficient poultry health knowledge on a veterinary level, but also on a farmer level within the private sector and also within the government, a service delivery system, so the organization of the animal health care and coordination between the different partners, and disease pre prevention and control systems. And for that, you need diagnostic capacity, but also compensation and contingency plans, knowledge on epidemiology, control systems, and coordination between the different stakeholders. So that's quite some challenges ahead if you want to set up an organized disease program, but also you can start on a lower level. So we use the words monitoring and surveillance um, often together and interchangeably. The surveillance is more related to what you do on your farm, demonstrating the absence of disease or infection, determination of presence or distribution of disease and infection, and early detection of new diseases. The monitoring is actually the collection of data to describe prevalence and severity of a disease in a population. It can also be related to antibiotic use or, for instance, the quality of vaccination and different tools can be used in those programs. So it's about more than just monitoring. It's also about politics and about economics. The use of monitoring and surveillance as a, control, as a tool to control animal health and also enhance production. To minimize the impact of disease, determine the effect of interventions, and optimize flock health and production. You can implement it on different levels of the production, and it can also lead to beneficial tools 
for your products. It can add value to your products or increase your productivity. So the monitoring system in the Netherlands. I would like to discuss that a little bit and also show you an example of how the monitoring system led to a decrease of disease problems. Animal health monitoring in the Netherlands is funded by both government, the ministry, and um, produ producer organizations and interbranch organizations. So that's private funding. And the objective are the early detection of outbreaks and identification of new diseases and infections agents and awareness of trends and developments in animal health and disease. And how does it work? Well, this is a, a schematic view. It starts at the bottom with farmers and veterinary practitioners who gather the data and the information. It's gathered by different tools, by a telephone help desk, by pathology, by data analysis and also prevalence studies. All that data is aggregated and interpreted actually at my company at GD, which we translate into trends, outbreaks and new phenomena. And that information is reported back to the uh, funding partners. So the ministry and also producer and intervention organizations. And the tools we use for that are almost all online. So um, farmers can register data into an identification and register, registration database, which is online, and they can also collect data back from that. They can see the disease state, status of their own farm, for instance, for salmonella. There's also a digital database for the registration of antibiotics use, for example, which is used for the monitoring, but also for research. Um, occasions. The example I want to show you very briefly uh, is one of Mycoplasma polysepticum and how it led to a decrease of the disease problem in the Netherlands. What you see here is a graph of the prevalence of um, MG, Mycoplasma polysepticum, in Dutch poultry from 1999 up to 2016. And the orange line is the prevalence in layers, where you see there is a sharp decrease in positive flux uh, from 2007 onwards. And also in breeders, there is a decrease. We had a few positive flux uh, in the early 2000s, and often we have zero to none in the more recent years. And this decrease was achieved by a top-down eradication approach for MG and also obligatory vaccination on MG positive multiple age layer farms. And what other data can we gather from that? Because of the complete identification and registration of farms and flocks in the Netherlands, we can create a map of poultry dense areas. And what you see here, the dark green areas are more poultry dense. If we then look at the outbreaks of MG that were detected, we can see in 2005 to 2007, the outbreaks were located in the poultry dense areas to the south of the Netherlands. And if we look at the more recent years, like 2013, where there were less um, outbreaks, so it was a low prevalence situation, we see that it was exactly in the poultry um, low density areas, which relates to the epidemiology of MG. The main risk factors in the early years of 2000s that were um, the high density areas because there were a lot of farms that were um, infected with MG that could infect other farms. And as prevalence went down, we see that there was a larger contribution of maybe also um, more backyard farming to the problem of MG in the Netherlands. So there is a, uh, a very clear shift in risk factors for MG related to poultry density and also prevalence of MG in the Netherlands. And that's just one of the examples I can give you. And if you're interested in more what you can achieve by monitoring, you can contact me. We also have a poll question to ask you. Um, it relates to the monitoring and how can it can benefit you. So I would want to ask you to fill in this uh, poll 
disease monitoring in my country, region, or company will affect my birds, not in any way, or by increasing health and welfare, by increasing profit, or both increasing health and welfare and profit. And disease monitoring would improve health, welfare, and profitability in my company, in my region or country, all of the above or none of the above. I'm very curious to see what your opinion on these poll questions is. And if you have any further questions, um, you can contact me through the chat. Thank you very much, Simeon, for your presentation uh, and giving us a view on the situation in the Netherlands. Well, in the meantime, I see that uh, the people are working on the poll. I think that can still go on uh, even if the next presentation is going on. Eh? So uh, I will continue with the next presentation now, where Janine has uh, yeah, given us an insight on the things in, in country level and disease monitoring. Now, Mr. Thomas Mans will come, director of high care of the Skippers Group, and he will give us, in fact, an insight in how to control diseases on farm level. For you, the floor, Thomas. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, well, uh, two presentations already about uh, disease monitoring, controlling. Uh, Dr. Niyagi also talked about uh, AMR, of course, eh? uh, a threat to uh, public health, of course. Uh, but eventually the question is, how do I implement my biosecurity measures really on a practical level uh, uh, on my farm or on my hatchery or on my breeder farm, uh, whatever uh, uh, people have uh, um, in flux. Um, first of all, my name is Thomas Mullers. I'm director of High Care within the Schippers Group, and High Care is a brand um, which helps farmers, uh, but also uh, uh, governments uh, and integrators, of course, by implementing uh, uh, cleaning and disinfection methods, all biosecurity measures on a practical level. And first of all, a few things are very important to know is that the uh, way uh, biosecurity measures are uh, are taking place in a farm or are implemented in a farm really has to do with the amount of infection pressure or disease pressure in a farm and throughout the world we see that the amount of farms are growing of course but also the amount of animals um, uh, the same and we know the more dense a population is within the uh, human population but also within the animal population uh, the more pressure of disease and infection we've got. So our biosecurity measures have to increase on that. And in the last years we've seen, and it's uh, globally, but also uh, um, um, in, in the Netherlands, uh, European wide, is that with the possibility to introduce uh, anti antimicrobials, so drugs, uh, a lot of hygiene me measures were taken a little bit to the background. So we had the possibility to repair very fast. And in the long end, we still had diseases, but we could repair and repair. And our goal is uh, uh, not to repair, but to prevent the amount of infections that come into the farm. And that brings us to my next slide is the health pyramid. Is it the other way around or? Okay. Is it perfect. Good? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, our health pyramid, uh, how do we look at uh, uh, livestock farming is first of all, we start at the base with taking uh, a care of hygiene. So if we build a farm, if we want to uh, put animals in a farm, we have to look at the base and that's hygiene. How is my farm built? Looking at vermin control, looking at rats, mice control, but also beetle control, of course. Um, but also how cleanable is my shed? Can I cl clean it properly? Um, um, can I disinfect it properly? Yes or no? How are my walking lines over my farm? And so on. And if the hygiene base is there, we can start to keep animals into this farm. And that's the caring part. And it's a little bit about ma uh, management, of course. Uh, do I have got enough knowledge about these animals? Uh, do I see the diseases? Yes or no? Can I prevent some diseases coming in? And after that, we've got our vaccine programs, which are, of course, very important to viral threats mainly. And in the last place, when it's really necessary, when all these three things below are in uh, control, 
then we can use antibiotics. And in the past, we've seen that it was the other way around. So we had uh, antibiotics uh, uh, available on a quite easy scale. And we started in some points with antibiotics and then we didn't look afterwards on the hygiene part. So we have to switch to another way of thinking on farm level. So no disease without infection. Uh, that's one of our uh, phrases and less infection pressure by improving hygiene. And looking at the farm, we always draw three circles in a very practical way. We've got a red circle and the red circle is to prevent introduction from outside. So what are the risks of uh, infections, germs coming into my farm and how, how do I prevent these infections coming in? And in a lot of cases, it's quite easily. So visitors, uh, uh, transport and so on are uh, quite easily known and uh, pronounced, but there are more risks uh, uh, outside our sheds. Then the next circle in this red line is the possibility of cross-contamination. And of course, the best way to keep your animals on one farm is to have the same age constantly by all in, all out. But we know also it's not always possible. So we've got different types of ages on one farm. And then even cross-contamination is far more important. So first of all, the red line, draw this line and look at the risks and then the uh, orange line, how do I prevent cross-contamination? And on the last line uh, that we're talking about, the yellow circle is, is really on shed level. How do I prevent reinfection? So recontamination from flock to another flock to another flock. And it's mainly because we've got older animals on, on one farm, take these animals out and put, for example, young broiler chicks in, one day old, and the less pressure of disease, of germs, the better the start is of these chicks, the uh, less uh, uh, battle they have to fight um, towards these germs, so the better they will start and less antibiotics are necessary over time. So very easy, three lines, look at the line, look at the risks that are popping up on this line and then make a plan. And this plan is the right uh, um, uh, solution to keep the risk as low as possible. Because taking the risk fully away is not uh, possible at any point, of course, but to really make it as low as possible is always the goal. And then the sources have to be pronounced and have to be looked at, which sources do I mainly have on these three lines of uh, disease introduction? Now on the red circle, I've uh, put a few examples uh, in my presentation. We have a look at uh, visitors, of course. Well, we need visitors, we need vets, of course, uh, on our farms, uh, mainly, uh, could be on a weekly basis, could be on a monthly basis, but it's a uh, risk. And what we try to achieve in our protocols is that every visitor at some point uh, changes clothes and even when it's more professional, so more dense population always showers before entering a farm. Then another one is, for example, transport, uh, feed, uh, uh, transportation of ch uh, chicks. There are different farms. Are they properly disinfected uh, in between uh, um, their transportations, yes or no? So it's a risk that diseases from one farm go to the other farm. The feed, of course, comes from another field, maybe close to another farm, could be um, uh, a risk. And of course, all the materials that are uh, used and come from outside our own farm. So in this case is the example of a slaughtery crate where we put the animals in, which come from the slaughterhouse, uh, could be a potential risks, a risk of germs getting into our farm. Then the orange line, so the cross-contamination line, we're talking about vermin, so all kinds of rats, uh, mice, beetles, but also birds. Can we keep our sheds uh, clean of them? Um, in some cases we know that sheds are open, other sheds are more closed, of course, but there is always 
the possibility to reduce the risk. And we go to a lot of countries uh, with our programs and we see of course that every country in every part of the world is different. And some parts it's very, very uh, uh, dense and a very big population with professional sheds out of concrete and so on and so on. So it's more easy to, um, to keep mice and rats out, but we have to do it as good as possible. If we're on a three from one to 10 uh, scale, if we're on a three, we have to try to get to a six or a seven. We can't go, go to the 10 directly. But also boots, changing boots from one shed to the other one is preventing uh, uh, germs uh, uh, spreading easily over time. Materials, uh, brooms, um, other types of things we need in a shed, uh, we mainly keep them in one shed to use uh, in that shed. Um, so diseases or uh, germs, certain germs are kept into that shed. And of course, ventilation, also one of the risks that one shed is contaminated with something from the other one. And then uh, the last one, recontamination. Well, um, first of all, also these materials. So if we're using these materials in one flock and the flock is eradicated from the farm and the new flock arrives are also our uh, materials that we use over there cleaned and or disinfected. The same as the sheds normally. Uh, beetles, which are already into the uh, shed, so the small vermin, as we call it. And one risk also is, of course, the water system. Because we know that from wells, which are not quite deep, and sometimes we see wells of only 10 meters deep, uh, we see that uh, with manure that's uh, spread out of the field, that, for example, E. coli of other types of germs can easily get into that well and therefore uh, recontaminate your new flock. Uh, and therefore, some part of disinfection or cleaning of your lines is very important um, to prevent the risk of recontamination. So quite easily known because I can talk about this uh, for a few hours and really can go into, into depth. But eventually the fact is the more dense uh, the population is, the more animals come together, the better the hygiene has to, has to be. Looking at our uh, health pyramids, we start with hygiene, then taking care of our animals and then vaccination programs and antibiotics uh, on top of that when it's really necessary. Look at three circles at all time around your farm or your hatchery or maybe your slaughterhouse, um, which can prevent contamination. Uh, so germs going in to your farm or from flock to flock. So really practical level. And I think that's necessary to make it really successful uh, in certain countries. Uh, to prevent diseases spreading. Okay, that this was your presentation, Thomas. Yeah, this was my presentation. I will yep. leave my contact details in the in the chat so people can uh, contact us uh, easily when there are any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation, Thomas. It was clear that uh, well, when farms grow bigger, of course, uh, disease monitoring, biosecurity becomes more and more important. Although it is always important. Uh, also, I think we can say when the birds are more expensive, uh, also uh, biosecurity becomes a very important item. And that is why Mr. Bart Stockfish will tell us about the importance and uh, how uh, to control diseases on, uh, on breeding farms. I think there will be a, well, a rather high level of biosecurity, but Mr. Bart will explain that to us. To you, the floor. Okay. Thank you, Jan. I will share my screen. And so the subject of my presentation this afternoon is yeah, the Hendrix Genetics Strategy on Biosecurity and Disease Monitoring. And I will share with you one slide about the Dutch strategy of high path avian influenza. So why is high health status important uh, for a breeding company like Hendrix Genetics? Well, it is about multiplication. Uh, what you can see here on this slide, I will use my pointer, is that 
Uh, we also are working with the permit in our production cycle. But when we are looking at pure line level from a D line female, we can make in theory 100 GP females. And again, from one GP female, we can make 100 parent stock females. That means that in theory, we are producing 500,000 eggs from one pure line female. And that makes us responsible. And yeah, this responsibility is very important for us. We must make sure that our production and our production is on pure line and on grandparent stock level, we must make sure that our production is free, free from pathogens and also free from contaminants and free from antibiotics. So, and be able to keep this health status, biosecurity is of extreme importance for us. What is biosecurity? In fact, biosecurity is an HACCP system. And that means it is a hazard analysis of critical control points. You need to know the risks and act accordingly. Risks can be excluded, risks can be eradicated, and risks can be managed. Why is biosecurity so important? It is about health status. It is about disease-free status. We are all producing food and food must be safe. Food must, must be free from pathogens and food must be, be free from contaminants. But it is also about cost-effective production. Healthy birds are very cost-effective producers. Disease costs energy, disease costs feed, and disease costs money. And the last one, looking at our company, we are exporting 99% of our production. That means that we must comply with the veterinary requirements of all the countries in the world. And to be able to do so, we need a very high health status of our own production flocks. So when you talk about biosecurity, you talk about contact infections. And contact infections are direct bird-to-bird -bird contacts or indirect contacts. Direct contacts, what can you do to prevent transfer of disease? And you can only introduce birds with a guaranteed health status. You can use quarantine facilities or like we do, you do not introduce birds. We are producing our own replacement stock on the farms themselves. Indirect contact, it's already mentioned by, by Janine a little bit and by Thomas. It is about fomites. Eh? So contaminated equipment, vehicles, people, but also vermin like rats, mice and wild birds. We are using a, 20, a 72 hours standstill for our visitors. So that means 72 hours free of poultry. But I think uh, when you can um, have 48 hours or maybe a little bit more practical three nights free of poultry that is already very nice you have to look at your workers uh, because when they have poultry at home when they have backyard poultry they will bring the pathogens from the their backyard to the farms you have to be critical on the materials equipment means of transport and already mentioned the poultry houses they should be bird and rodent proof. 
biosecurity measures must be simple. They must be well understandable. They must be agreed upon. And last but not least, they must be monitored. So not only the measures must be monitored, but also the result of your program must be monitored. In my opinion, biosecurity is the cheapest and the most effective tool in disease control. I will give you as an example, some information about our own monitoring program. And it's not so complicated. Uh, we monitor on all Salmonella serotypes and we monitor on Mycoplasma galicepticum and Mycoplasma synovia. That is the basis of our program. And of course, there are some others. And I'm using two different colors. The black color that are measures, monitorings that we do ourselves, voluntary. And the blue color, that is the obligatory program in the Netherlands. Uh, that is sampling that we have to do. So when you look at the rearing, we have an, uh, a check when the Dale chicks arrive. And we have a check when the reared pullets are transferred from the rearing farm to the production farm. And you can see the program is based on Salmonella and on Mycoplasma. At the end of rearing, yeah, we need to show that our vaccination program against Newcastle disease was successful. And we also need to show that the reared pullets are free from avian influenza. What we also do is we check the results of our vaccination program for chicken anemia, for gambaro, and for avian encephalomyelitis. And we want to know that the pullets are free of EDS. In the production period, the program is also targeting on salmonella and mycoplasmas. And we are sampling every 14 days. And the reason for that is quite simple. We want to be able to take the hatching eggs out of the machines when we detect a contamination. And so that means that, yeah, when we find something, you know, the collection of hatching eggs will take between five and 12 days. They are in the machines for three for three weeks. And so when we sample every 14 days, when we find something, we can take the hatching eggs out of the machines before they pull. And also at the hatchery, every hatch, every hatcher is sampled for salmonella. Also here, we check for Newcastle and we check for avian influenza. And also during the production periods, we check on EDS, Gambaro, again, avian influenza, but that is our own program. We are checking the flocks every eight weeks. That is above the national program. We check on infectious laryngotracheitis and for export reasons, we also check monthly on Salmonella pylorum gallinarum. So just a few words on the Dutch high path avian influenza strategy. It's already mentioned by Janine, but it is based on early warning, early detection. And we have a small country with a lot of poultry. So that means that we must be fast. And it is also European uh, legislation that our farmers are compensated when there is a case of avian influenza, but they get 100% of their birds compensated when the birds are healthy. They get 50% when they are sick and they get nothing when they are dead. 
And the farmers know that very well. So they know that they must be fast to get a high compensation. So that means that they will warn their own veterinarian and when their own veterinarian does not trust the situation, they will notify to the government and then there will be a team of veterinarians visiting the farm and taking samples. When there is a farm positive, it is um, the, the animals are killed and removed. And most of the time, also in the one kilometer zone, the farm is emptied and killed. In the three kilometer zone and 10 kilometer zone, there is a screening. We take uh, blood samples. We take trachea swaps and we take cloaca swaps. And there is a standstill. And I think this standstill period is very, very important. No movement of animals or animal products in a period until 30 days after cleaning and disinfection of the infected farm. Of course, when this period is taking a long time, there are some exceptions uh, because yeah, the birds and the farms, they need feed. And sometimes there is also an exception on the re removing of, of eggs. But the principle is stand still, no movement of animals. As uh, Hendrix Genetics, we are very pr proud that since September 2018, we have an, an avian influenza-free compartment. And this is quite a special compartment because it contains eight locations spread over the country. So it is not a certain area, a certain part of the country that is free, but it is a group of farms that is free of avian influenza and that has a special status. And it is not so complicated to have it and to maintain it, but you can imagine that these farms are isolated from the other poultry farms in the Netherlands. So thank you far, very much for your, your attention and I am open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart, for your presentation. Well, all together now we have seen a variety of presentations about the situation in Kenya, situation in Holland, uh, what can be done on farm level, and also especially which uh, very strict measurements are uh, kept in breeding farms. Uh, which also proves that it is possible, of course, to keep your birds disease free, but we all know also that it is not uh, that easy. Thank you all for the presentations. I will switch over now to the Q&A and I have one question here from Pietro Stella. What would be the suggestion to improve disease monitoring control for countries in which diagnostic facilities at private and government level in the poultry sector are still inadequate? I think this is a question first for uh, Janine, but if somebody else also wants to answer it, it's okay. But first, Janine. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your question also. I think it's a very actual and um, important question. Um, and I think there are two strategies. First, I would like to advise you to uh, gather partners and um, initiate or continue the discussion on increasing uh, diagnostic capacity in your region. Um, maybe it's possible to also involve government and private sector together and look for options. But on the other hand, you can also start uh, by yourself already and I think there are a few options you can first start by looking what can I do at my farm for instance if you use a vaccination is it possible to add a coloring agent to check the coverage of your vaccination 
Um, there are also options with point of care tests that are being developed uh, at quite a high rate these days. So maybe that's an option for you. Um, it's possible to use new methods to um, collect diagnostic material on paper, on FDA paper, and send it to a laboratory that is farther away from your location and still do accurate testing. And there are also possibilities to use tests that are uh, also possible in less facilitated uh, laboratories. So it's not always uh, needed to do an ELISA test, for example, but you can also do an, uh, an HI test. So yeah. we can look for the options. Thank you, Janine, for this clear answer. Yeah, it does not immediately have to be perfect. Everything what you do is already uh, helping, of course. And uh, yeah, to go to perfect, what also Bart said, I think that takes time. You cannot immediately, and also Thomas mentioned that I can remember, you cannot immediately go to the highest level of hygiene. It has, it is a, it is a procedure, it is a number of steps you have to take. Is there anybody of the speakers who wants to add something to this answer? No, thank you. Then I go to the next question, which I have for Thomas. How important is cleaning compared to disinfection? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Jan and, and viewers. Um, well, there, there are main discussion about the fact that, that there are detergents in, in, in certain markets and disinfection materials. And uh, regarding disinfection, we're all we're very fast talking about what kind of disinfection, uh, uh, what kind of chemicals and so on and so on. Um, uh, but in my uh, opinion, in our opinion, uh, uh, cleaning, uh, so a detergent for cleaning is, is uh, as uh, important as a disinfection is. So when cleaning a shed, uh, a barn, a farm, um, uh, whatever you want to clean, a hatchery, uh, always look first at uh, the way of cleaning with a detergent. And after that, you can have a good disinfection. And in many, case, many cases, people are already talking very, very quick about what kind of chemicals. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, we have to talk about cleaning first. And when the cleaning is right, disinfection also is right at all times when having the good product, of course. Okay, when I summarize it very short, maybe no good disinfection without a good cleaning. Or is totally that right. too short? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you. I also have a question here for Bart. Is it expensive to maintain AI, AI disease-free status, like you mentioned in your presentation? Well, um, of course, as a breeding company, we have a certain setup of farms. And what we also did when we bought farms and when we contracted farms and that we had a close look at the location. Uh, so that is also important. Um, what is the location and what is the poultry density in the area where the, where the farm is located? And of course, this setup you can do in front. Uh, when you already have a farm, you cannot change the location and then this will not help you. But for the rest, it is just minimizing contact. That is what we do. I am visiting the farms once every four week, weeks, and I am in fact the only visitor. Uh, of course, we have to deliver feed. We try to minimize that. We use big silos so that we have um, less contact and we use a dedicated truck. The same is for the collection of hatching eggs. The frequency, two times a week maximum, and with our own truck. And then for the rest, yeah, it is, it is not so complicated. The monitoring system, when you look at avian influenza, is, yeah, in fact, from the government part, only once uh, a year. We do it a little bit extra, but our system is based on Mycoplasma synovia, to be honest. My, Mycoplasma synovia is an indicator 
for our system because in the Netherlands still a lot of commercial layers are positive for mycoplasma synovia and that means that the risk of infection is the highest with MS and that is also one of the reasons why we monitor on MS so that is an indicator of our biosecurity system you can monitor on avian influenza once every week but when the country is free you know that that the results are negative and so you must look for some some indicator to check your system okay thank you very much for this answer i have a question also for dr bodaya and that is what can be the role of it information technology in disease monitoring Please unmute. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, IT and mobile technology have a role to play in the modern uh, disease surveillance in terms of easing or quickening the, the 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 reporting the reporting of disease outbreaks or setting disease alerts or sharing disease incidences across the country. And in Kenya, we are trying to take advantage of that by developing some, uh, for example, Google-based uh, disease uh, report sharing uh, platform where we are able to get uh, a very quick reporting from across the country uh, to a central uh, repository of uh, information data or reports. We've also trying to take advantage of uh, mobile uh, technology knowing that uh, perhaps Kenya is one of those countries where mobile telephony has really spread to the very lowest parts of the of the, uh, population. And so we have developed an app that is used by uh, various animal health service providers to be able to capture disease incidences and share them real time uh, with the CBO or the central repository and also to be able to interactively engage the neighboring animal health service providers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Obaya, Obadaya, for this answer. I have a very short question here, and I think it's mostly for Thomas. Is there any disinfectant to work under one minute? Uh, yes, yes, there are. And uh, quite few also. We also have to always have to look at uh, the, uh, you've got two different types of uh, disinfectants. Uh, let me put it this way. One is the uh, the long working disinfecting, uh, as I call it, the non-corrosive ones, and you got the short term working and that are the more corrosive ones. So uh, they talking more about chemicals like the, the chlorine based products, uh, the, um, the peroxide based products and so on. So yeah, there are products uh, underneath one minute. Okay, then I have a Thank you for that answer. I have another question also for you, for Thomas. How long after disinfection remain effectiveness of disinfectant on surface? Um, uh, well, it has to kill the germs uh, where they are in, uh, where the, 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 the disinfection is in contact with. So the fact is, it, it's not about the, the, uh, the long term working of the product, but it's about the uh, effectiveness of the product directly when it's uh, contacting a surface or a germ. Mm -hmm. um, looking at all kinds of chemicals and, and uh, disinfectants, uh, we don't want them to work for like uh, uh, seven weeks or, or seven years, uh, I would say. Um, so in a lot of cases, you've got products uh, uh, for one minute, five minutes, uh, sometimes two hours, the non-corrosive ones, as we call it. Uh, and they would like to uh, have all your germs killed, at least uh, the most of them. And that's the uh, um, uh, most important. One thing to add to that is what we see in practice. It's not about the product in combination uh, with the dilution or solution that you're making. But uh, we see in a lot of cases that goes wrong. So we have, we have uh, uh, a germ pressure, which is way too high because of the way of application. So the way of application is not right. Very fast or not good touch, uh, touching of surfaces and so on and so on. So 50% is the chemical, 50% is the way of applying it. And that's the result. 
the total picture is always important with this yeah. kind of things uh, and the weakest link in the chain uh, makes how strong the chain is uh, certainly with biosecurity that is also an important point i have one last question because of the time and this one i would send to janine uh, if gd would help to set up a monitoring and surveillance system in my country would it be the same system as in the netherlands um, well, I think in general, it could be the same system because of uh, the objectives of the, the system we have in the Netherlands, that would be the same. Um, but how it would look, that would be uh, tailor-made to the country or region. And also depending on the information that's already available, as uh, Dr. Nyagi from uh, Kenya already mentioned, they have an app collecting data, so it would be very good to incorporate that into your monitoring and surveillance system. So yes Perfect. and no. Yeah. So yeah, the, the short summarize could be yeah. The, the principle is the same in the Netherlands as uh, everywhere in the world, but you have to make it fit tailor made on the local situation, which uh, yeah sounds very logic to me. And I think that is also a very uh, nice conclusion to end this uh, webinar with. But first, I want to ask for the call for action on the screen now, if that is possible. Yeah, very well, very good. Um, yeah, uh, well, I will say a few more words, so don't leave yet. Uh, but if people want to express their interest to participate in a working group together with Royal GD, with Janine, to provide the basis for a regional approach by sending, an, you can do that by sending an email to me. Uh, I will be the collector and I will certainly forward it to Janine and uh, also maybe to the other people to see what we can do together uh, in a working group to set up uh, a basic approach uh, in your country. So for the people who are interested to be part of this group, please send an email to me. Maybe you don't have a pen, then I would say just make a print screen of this screen and you can send it to jan.hulzebos at nabc.nl. And that makes that we have come to an end of this uh, webinar. Uh, yeah, I think that it became clear that, of course, uh, disease control, uh, biosecurity, health is one of the very important things for profitable poultry production. Uh, of course, uh, it is an ongoing process. It is not something that you do now and you are ready forever. It is something that has to be controlled comp constantly that you have to take, yeah, new diseases will come. Uh, you have to take new measurements. Uh, new types of housing systems will come uh, in the Netherlands, for example, we changed from battery cages to floor housing system, which uh, yeah, makes, of course, a new approach necessary again. So it's something that never will stop. Um, I will thank all the speakers for their participation. And certainly, of course, I also will thank uh, the audience for uh, participating for their questions. And I wish everybody a lot of success in keeping the poultry healthy. Thank you very much for your attention and for your participation.